before I go, I just want you two to know something, all right? The Super Cop story was working, okay? It was working, <laughs> and you guys just messed it up, okay? I'm trying to figure you guys out, but I haven't yet, but it's cool. You fuck up a perfectly good <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's oh, good. Yeah. It's actually... You're not really doing Eddie either, well, which is Here's what wise. I was going to say. Yeah. This is the thing I always find fascinating re-watching this movie, which th I this is my second time watching this movie maybe this calendar year. Sure. I watch it fairly often. Mm -hmm. uh, for most of the movie, he's not doing Eddie to the degree you remember him doing it. Not at it's all. It's a much more subdued performance yeah, no, than the cultural not. memory of it. Understated film in every way in the Eddie oeuvre right. and even in the Beverly Hills Cop oeuvre. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he's kind of quiet in this yeah. for how much he's like this fucking Bugs Bunny style right. shit stirrer. Right. But it's hard to impersonate quiet Eddie. Well, you did your great did a great job. I didn't. I just said it in my own voice. All right, we'll introduce the show. This we got to kick right off. With Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce, baby. Yes. <laughs> That's a little bit of an impression. I can do that part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is a mini series on the films of Martin Brest. Yep. And today we're talking about. What's it called? It's called Podverly Hills Cast. Very good. And we've reached the titular episode. Not just his biggest hit, but one of the biggest hits of all time. Yeah. For about 20 years, it was the highest grossing R rated movie ever. What beat it? The Matrix? It was either Matrix or Passion of the Christ. Right, and then right, both right, ended right, up beating right. it. And now I think it's Deadpool. <laughs> sure. That's fine. <laughs> who like popped into Detroit and said, hey, Axel, I beat your record. He probably right. knew. Right right, 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 right. Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. Martin Brest film. A big movie. Yeah. One of the most influential of all time. So who we got to big talk about guess. it? Two big ass guests. Yeah. Another, a fellow ampersand. Yeah, right. Along with Griffin and David, you mean? Yes. Yep. Uh, they are uh, inexplicably on this show, despite being the directors of <laughs> Bad Boys Ride or Die. <laughs> yep. <laughs> in theaters this June. Yep. Here I guess they it will have just come out by the time this episode comes out. Sure. This episode comes out June 16th. So it's in theaters. It just yes. came out. Uh, Go see Bad Boys Ride or Die. Adil and Bilal, thank you so Hi. much for being on the show. Yo. What's up, guys? Thanks for having us. Uh, your publicist reached out and said you were fans and that you wanted to come on the show, which is dumb. <laughs> 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 which is the least I've ever respected you guys as artists. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but but you guys are uh, have had this like incredible uh, career arc. Uh, you started out making like independent films in Belgium, and then now have like escalated to the highest levels of Hollywood blockbuster dumb. But your, your publicist reached out and we were trying to figure out if there was like a good episode to have you on because we booked so stupidly far in advance. We wanted to see if there's anything that would time out to the new Bad Boys coming out. And then uh, suddenly Beverly Hills Cop opened up as an episode. And I remembered that you guys were originally announced to direct Beverly Hills Cop 4. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Totally yeah. correct. Yeah. So is this like a major movie for the two of you? Absolutely. I think that, you know, growing up uh, in, in Belgium, uh, that movie was was one of my favorite, all-time favorite movies ever. And that's also a movie that made me a fan of uh, of Eddie Murphy. Right. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that song is so iconic. That movie is iconic. Uh, really changed. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a big impact on, on us and on the world. Yeah, it is one of those films that, like, uh, you, you feel Hollywood has just been uh, chasing. Now for 40 years? Yeah, damn. Yeah, 40 years. Yeah. And it's fascinating because you you dig into this movie and almost everything that works about it was a mistake. Right. Or was something that was like changed on the fly. And and like just re-watching the film, you're like, this is the building blocks of what every executive is trying to get every other movie to be now on purpose. Right. And it was, you're right. It, it is a story of like a bunch of happy accidents creating... A pretty like like you say low key movie, yeah. For like a crime comedy, like it's it's not a crazy movie, and yet it creates like a whole crazy world. There's one crazy car chase at the beginning, yeah, and there's one big shootout at the end. Yeah, sounds like a sounds like a Jerry Bruckheimer formula. Actually. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's happy accidents. <laughs> it's it's a bit like um, his trademark. That's the way that he in the eighties, you know, you know, him together with Don Simpson. 
they would, you know, do crazy stuff and stuff that were maybe also lower budget than what the rivals were doing. And yet these movies were fresh in the 80s and 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 had like this tremendous amount of success. Yeah, this is kind of his first like action movie, right? Because he'd done Flashdance before yeah. this. Right. They had done Flashdance right. before this. That's the other thing. Right. This basically this makes is kind of the, the start of all that. formula. Right. Uh, it's also funny that it's like a comedy that doesn't have obvious comedy set pieces. Well, all the comedy yeah, is conversations. It's right. It's yeah, the set pieces are him, are him bouncing off of somebody. Right. right, and there are a couple scenes he basically wills into being set pieces by making really strong comedic choices. Right, right. But there aren't on paper like he walks into this room and this situation is so funny. <laughs> yeah, the the bad guys are straight. I think yes. that that's also what's what's a kind of a trademark of uh, not only Jerry Bruckheimer and, and Don Simpson, but just the, the the you could say the action comedy or the big action movies of of the eighties. If you think about Die Hard or Lethal Weapon, there's a lot of comedy coming from the characters, coming from the dialogue and and the banter. But the the bad guys are straight, and the danger is real, and and that is what you know what we're kind of missing also nowadays. I think that without Beverly Hills Cop, you would never had a, a bad boys movie, a Michael Bay's totally. first bad Absolutely. boys film. Yeah, I mean it's true. Like now, it feels like every action film, the villain has to be this like big broad performance, be it comedic or be it like yeah, even yeah, in right, serious right. action movies, and quote unquote here, serious action. It's movies. just like let's hire a British playwright. He'll sit behind a desk. He's mean. We get it. <laughs> like he's thing a thing problem. That's so hard to replicate about this movie is like you basically construct a serious Sylvester Stallone movie, right. build it around him, then Stallone walks and you just change the actor. And like right. a Bugs Bunny cartoon where he pops out of his hole into the wrong place and causes trouble, yeah. you have Eddie Murphy just entering someone else's movie, basically. And everyone else kind of still thinks they're in the Stallone version. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's like no one else got the memo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. And it, which is perfect. Which is perfect. And Breast is like in complete control of the dial of making those two things mesh. And quietly, the most satisfying thing in the movie is watching him like slowly convert John Ashton and Judge Reinhold to his movie. Right. Like they start out in the Stallone and they're the two people he kind of brings over. Right. They're like, come on, we have to go by the book. Come on, what are you doing? Like this is, yeah. Right. But, uh, but then they're like, on the other hand, this guy's fucking popping. He's probably about to start a 10 year uncontested run as America's biggest movie star. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. also, you know, the Eddie Murphy at that time was, uh, 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 for such a young age, at the height of his power in uh, on the comedy scene. And, and what, what Jerry and Don Simpson and obviously also director Martin Brest saw was like, this is this is the new guy. This is a rising star. And um, and, and he was not internationally famous no. yet. So that's really the movie that, that brought him to the world. That's why we, you know, we, we didn't know um, Eddie Murphy through his comedy. We knew him through the movies like... Uh, like Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, yeah. What's your what's your origin story? Like, is this an early one for you guys? Like, when you're young, are you getting into Hollywood action movies? Like, in the I mean, I don't know. You're about my age, right? In the '90s. Like, I'm, what what's the uh, what's the backstory with you and Beverly Hills Cop? Yeah, it's just when you're a kid, uh, you see Beverly Hills Cop. It just one of the coolest cops you ever saw on television. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, um, you know, he's. He's cool, he's funny, he's you know breaking the rules and 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 that is so much fun to see. And uh, at the same time, because it's like a really grounded story, you feel like it's real, but he just makes it so you know attractive. And and when I was yeah, when I was a kid and you just wanted to be a part of that. Yeah. What about you, Griff? Where are you a Beverly Hills cop? Uh that's a good question. I think I saw it when I was probably a little too young. Mm-hmm. I saw it maybe when I was like nine or ten. Yeah. Because I, I was getting into Eddie Murphy, but mostly through like the family movies. Your Dr. Doolittle. Right. And my mom, who was very overprotective and would block a lot of stuff I wanted to watch, was like, you should watch Beverly Hills Cop. If you think Eddie Murphy is funny, you should watch Beverly Hills Cop. That's when he's really at his funniest. Right. And like uh, rented it and kind of got it. It's kind of grown up. It's kind of too grown up for you. I would say at that age, because the so humor is actually s subtle for yes, a child. Yes, yes, which I didn't get as like, and I, I am a big fan of the the Eddie Murphy's ninety family comedy. Sure, yeah, yeah but yeah. they're a lot louder. It's a different register. I, I was also deep into SNL, so I was watching like Eddie SNL best ofs and stuff like that. Right, uh, and then I feel like when I was like nineteen, I went through like an insane Eddie Murphy phase where I watched the stand up movies, and then I like filled in the gaps in all the movies I hadn't seen. 
I have said before that I think in many ways he is like the greatest raw talent movie star of all time. Right. I just think few yeah. guys are like mm -hmm. that charismatic and that skilled at every single possible thing you could want a movie star to do. And I think the range of his career is insane. And that's when I sort of rewatched Beverly Hills Cop. And I think around that time found out the backstory of how it came together. And I was like, well, now I totally get this thing. And right. it's become a thing I watch like once a year uh, since then. Was Bruckheimer the guy's... Was he... You come on to Beverly Hills Cop 4 first in development. And then through that, you get Bad Boys for Life. Is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, we were fans of, of Jerry Bruckheimer films, uh, like, you know, obviously Beverly Hills Cop, also Top Gun and Bad Boys, um, Paris the Caribbean. So, you know, he's a very iconic uh, producer. So as when we were students, our dream would be like, if one day we get the chance to go to Hollywood, then uh, the first thing we're going to ask for is Bad Boys 3 because they had <laughs> yeah. not made it yet. Right. So, so that was, you know, the very first meeting we had with, with Jerry in 2015. We were like, hey, can we do Bad Boys? And he said, the movie's not available because back then it was Joe Carnahan that was uh, oh, attached wow, to that right Yeah. So, right. Uh, so we were like, you know, I mean, even though we were big fans of Joe Carnahan, we were kind of dif disappointed that we couldn't get that project. And that's where in 2016, uh, Beverly Hills Cop 4 came by and at that time it was still set up at Paramount so basically our, our first feature film that we got was uh, was uh, Beverly Hills Cop 4 wow that was, that's that was, crazy that was like uh, two years before uh, before we got the job of Bad Boys and you had made your first two features at that point or just the first one no, yeah, we had we had done two features. We had done a, a, the movie that sort of was our ticket to Hollywood was a, a, a Romeo and Juliet story set in the gangs of Brussels uh, called Black. Right. And that was a movie that, that Will Smith has seen and, and Jerry and we had won a prize at the TIFF uh, Toronto Film Festival. So that was the movie that, that based on that movie, we got the job for, uh, for uh, Beverly Hills Cop. I, I've seen uh, Rebel, the most recent film you made in between the bad boys uh, that is so incredibly good. And Thank is you. fairly available in the states. Black and Gangster are kind of hard to watch now. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's like you gotta <laughs> you gotta really search for it. Maybe on iTunes, I don't know, but it's always a question. Like, why, where can, why the fuck can we find those movies? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, do some Blu-rays. Let's see. Wait a second. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah, we should we should fix that. Maybe after after Bad Boys Four comes out, uh, or yeah, by the time the, this podcast is there, it's you success, obviously. Inshallah, <laughs> Inshallah, God <laughs> willing, it's hard we'll to do, find. We'll, Damn. We'll, yeah, Rebel just got a good Blu-ray release cool. from cool. Yellowville, yeah. I think. Yeah. That's like yes, exactly. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got that stuff. The first two, I was I was doing some scanning earlier this morning. Black, I think you can import a French DVD. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> we'll, we can send you a link. You know, we have a yeah, yeah. Vimeo link somewhere that we can send you <laughs> yeah, guys. You just uh, send it to your uh, mail. <laughs> Gangsta, I think if you do some Express VPN toggling, you might be able to find it on some of the streaming services in probably. other countries. Yeah, but wait, so what is that like coming on board? You're coming on board this movie that's like, what, 20 plus years. Everyone's been like, will there be another one? Like, is it a, is it a full feature? And it's like, this is the script. This is Eddie. You guys do it. Or is it still like a complete mystery what the movie will actually be? Yeah, yeah. What were you coming on to at that point? Yeah, no, at the, at the time there was already a script. Uh, and that's when... Uh, when we read it and yeah, we were like, ah, oh, that's a super fresh take. Orig for us also just creatively, it was a really uh, interesting approach. And and just, you know, just the idea of working with Eddie was just like mind blowing. <laughs> and uh, and then we met Eddie for the first time. Right. And that was, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like an unforgettable scene. Uh, and we yeah. felt just like unbelievable, like working with a legend like him and, and seeing you know, his energy and we were like, uh, we, we, it's going to be a good movie. We'll direct the, the shit out of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2016. <laughs> yeah. oh, man, it's Little that did long we know. ago. <laughs> 2016. That's, damn, that's a long time ago. I'm right. curious because, as, as David said, it was like 20 plus years of development of like, will they ever make a Beverly Hills Cop 4, right? The first two were so huge. The third was kind of like a bit of a disappointment. And I feel like for decades, I would just read Eddie Murphy in interviews say, like, I'm really unhappy with the third movie. Right. I'd like to do a fourth to try to redeem it, but I also don't want to do it unless it feels totally right. right. And there was this feeling of, like, three got away from the character. 
this weird arc of like what we were saying of the first movie being this perfect balance. Then the second movie, you get Tony Scott, like the king of Bruckheimer style. And right. the movie so, is yeah. also goofier and more comedic on paper. Mega over the top, mega violent, mega, right. yeah. I like Beverly Hills Cop 2 a lot, to be clear. But it yeah. is, right, it is not restrained. The third one is Landis, who's traditionally a goofier Hollywood right. comedy director. But Eddie's much more straight in that. It's kind of structurally more of a conventional action movie. When you guys are having those meetings, are there things you're identifying of like, this is how we get Axel Foley back on right. track? This is what is interesting about like, Axel. You, right. What is yeah. the core of Beverly Hills Cop? And Obviously, Axel I know Foley. you guys didn't end up making the movie. Yeah, but you're having all these <laughs> yeah. conversations. <laughs> yeah, hypothetically. <laughs> in yeah. another universe. Yeah, yeah in, the, in the other multiverse. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, the thing is that what we loved about the first two movies and, and the, you know, the first movie, it got nominated for an Oscar yep. for Best Screenplay. So he was, you know, people forget that it was an Oscar movie. Um, and Martin Brest was, you know, he was really good at putting, like when it was a serious story, he would put comedy in it. Or if yep. it was a, like a comedic story, he would put some serious aspect in it. And it was always about the characters. It was also what Jerry always told us. It's all about the characters and, and the humanity of the characters. That's why those, you know, those movies are iconic. You remember Axel Foley, you remember uh, uh, Taggart and Rosewood. And and we loved the the grittiness that you had of the first film. Um, which is, you know, quite serious. Like the scenes that, that when you have the bad guys and they, they, they kill his best friend at the beginning of the movie, it's still, you know, if you watch it today, it's very gritty. It's, it's almost like a scene from The Wire um, and it has that vibe. And I think that that's also why they responded to our work because if you watch it in black, it's, it's a really pretty harsh uh, uh, story as well. And, um, and at the same time, we loved so much Tony Scott and his style and, and, and the, you know, Bruckheimer and Tony Scott. Like, you know, it's like also Michael Bay or early Michael Bay has really that distinct, it's, it's very stylish, you would say. Maybe it's over the top, but we thought it was cool. So we really wanted to do a blend of that grittiness, really, you know, ground story. Uh, and at the same time, a stylish Tony Scott homage. So that's that's kind of the vibe that that we had. And. And I think that if you watch Bad Boys for Life, you sort of recognize right. that that vibe. You know, Bad Boys, even though it's a sequel to a Michael Bay movie, for us it was more like an homage to the 19th style of Tony Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer. I, I think, yeah. It, it's it's a thing I really Quite liked rocks. about uh, Bad Boys for Life. And I'm excited to see the new one as well, is that like I think you guys put all of those things in the pot. Um, let's let's dig into the development yeah, right, of this. Right, because right, it, it is, is a crazy development. It's one of those right, like okay. incredible legendary Hollywood stories. 1975, Michael Eisner, who is at that point president of Paramount. One day he'll run Disney, obviously. Mm -hmm. He's speeding Hello. on an L.A. Freedman. He a gets, Freedman? Uh, free, the L.A. Freeway. Jeez, Christ. Stopped <laughs> by a policeman. Is Says that the uh, policeman was ex efficient, rude, with an air, air of superiority and quiet condescension. I mean, you were speeding, Michael, but I understand. <laughs> yeah. And he uh, goes into the office and is like, we should do a movie about a Hollywood cop. Like, but that's it, basically. He gets pulled over for speeding and is like, I've got an idea. That's a classic, like, coked out Hollywood development story <laughs> of, like, a cop pulled yeah. me over and I got an idea for a movie. Now, Don Simpson, who is no longer with us, mm -hmm. but is, of course, the producer of this film, says that's all bullshit and the movie had been developed for years before Michael Eisner cooked up this stupid story. Who knows right. what the answer is? <laughs> but uh, Bruckheimer real... says, like, no, yeah. yeah, it was Don's idea and Eisner just, like, took credit for it. Who Success knows? has many fathers, failures, <laughs> and orphan. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously, Don and Jerry, at that point, they're ensconced at uh, Paramount. They've mm -hmm. done Flashdance, which is this movie that, like, sounds absurd. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, this, like, hot Pittsburgh Spielberg steelworker wants to be a dancer. And they make it into this, like, glossy hit. And that's yes. sort of this thing of, like, oh, these guys must know something if they're, like, able to turn this around, right? It's, it's what we often, I mean, we often talk about it. We always talk about it through the prism of directors with the blank check thing of, like, we cannot quantify why this was a success outside of the notion that maybe these people have the secret formula that we don't. So let's just let them do more. Right. So they start getting in writers to try and crack this idea and basically, they're like, we need an outsider thing, right? Like, we need he, the, you know, one writer, uh, Danilo Bach, comes in and sort of creates the villain, which is this like, you know, nasty Beverly Hills businessman guy. And they're mm -hmm. like, right, okay, so we need someone who's going to like crack that. 
open. Sure. Daniel Petrie, who comes in, who I think is the only credited screenwriter, Correct. right? Which yeah. is wild, because this movie has like eight trillion writers on it before right. Eddie Murphy comes to set and just does whatever he wants. And he's like, he brings in like the cops from Detroit. He's a fish out of water. His yeah. friend's been killed. All of that stuff is Petrie's, uh, whatever, you know, spine. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Bruckheimer sees a picture of Mickey Rourke in Diner and tears it out and is like, this is who I want. Yeah. So Mickey Rourke, like young, cool, Pope of Greenwich Village Mickey mm -hmm. Rourke is the first choice. He drops out. Sylvester Stallone steps in and of course is like, I'm going to rewrite this movie. I'm going to turn him back into like a bloody action movie. Yes. And and part of it was, as has always been the legend, you know, the constant like throughout the 80s and 90s arms race between Schwarzenegger and Stallone, where they were constantly trying to one up each other. Uh, this is right when Schwarzenegger is starting to pop. Yes. yes. And so we need to make bigger, bigger, bigger. Right. right. Yeah. And Stallone's like, I got to make the most violent movie of all time <laughs> that he starts to put <laughs> onto Beverly Hills Cop his ambition of. I've had this dream of making a movie that has absurd amounts of violence, and I think this is the right vehicle for it. Right. Now, meanwhile, Martin Brest is getting ready to make war games. Yes. He is made going in style. It did pretty well. And he gets hired onto this movie that, you know, is pretty much ready to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Matthew Broderick, he claims he was, he hired Matthew Broderick. But apart from that, I think War Games was like, you know, an existing script sure. that he's coming yeah. on board. And then he gets fired and replaced by John Badham. Mm hmm. He says like a week into filming. Yes, he says he spent more times on War Game than Beverly Hills Cop. He was on it for a year and a half full time, and just before production, an executive producer who he won't mention basically came in and fires him. He says three weeks into production. Okay, I don't. He's. We assume he's talking about Leonard Goldberg, who's a, a famous Fox president at the time. I don't really know why he got fired. I guess just probably because he was like, I'm going to do it my way. And this producer was like, this is what the movie needs to be. I, it seems like that kind yeah, of a fight. Also, I mean, as we will, we've already touched on and we'll touch on even more in this series. Uh, Breast notoriously meticulous. Yeah, I assume you guys have never met Marty Breast, but he's got, no, right, he's got this reputation. Yeah, we heard, we heard he's very, uh, like a perfectionist. Right, uh, yeah. Right. We heard that he actually had 12 days apparently on, uh, on War Games before he got uh, crazy. ditched. Yeah, it's wild. Um, so and and at the time that feels like well, that's the worst thing professionally that can happen to a major. Yeah, film you've been director. tagged early in your career with this disaster. Like, right? Yeah, right. you were on a movie and they fired you from it. You guys, of course, ended up being the canaries in the coal mine well, for the yeah, new that's worst the, thing. That's that what you call the uh, movie director. jail. Basically, you're you're in movie jail, and yeah. um, I believe that Jerry told Martin Brest. Probably the same thing he told us. I'm going to get you out of movie jail. So <laughs> I think that's literally it. Like yeah. they, Simpson and Bruckheimer pursue him. They're yeah. like, come make this movie. Sylvester Stallone's going to direct it. Simpson says, look, he's smart and funny, which is hard to get. And uh, uh, <laughs> this Stallone's is not going to direct it. Stallone's going to. No, I'm saying it. Stallone's yeah. the star, but I'm right. saying like they're, they're like, come in. This is the yeah. Sly Stallone project. Direct this for us, please. And, and Simpsons line yeah. is we always like Marty and if he killed a 13 year old dog we'd still have hired him which is a great like Don Simpson <laughs> line sounds like a Don Simpson line <laughs> yeah. exactly have you guys seen Going in Style yes yeah. yes 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 it's so fucking good and it is like yeah. ostensibly a low level crime comedy in a way <laughs> But it isn't an obvious choice to look at that movie and be like this guy should direct a full on action film yeah it is yeah yeah, it, it's just like going in style has the humanity. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's what that's what, um, what 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 Jerry and Don Simpson probably responded to. Like yeah. these three characters, these three uh, old guys are are iconic, and you feel for them. And it's it's you know that's that's probably why they responded to. It. And it it feels and it feels real. Like it it, it there's there's something. Like the like, there's a, a kind of quality vibe to it. It it, it takes even though there's so this humor of it. There's there's a kind of earnestness in it and, and seriousness and you un you, you understand the, how serious Martin Brest takes um, the that movie the characters and, and the story 100% the other thing which this movie is just a perfect example of is like a lot of the great lightning in a bottle movies in history come out of a combination of people who all have something to prove I think Brest being in a position where he's just suffered this setback yeah he's he's in this mindset of like if 
if I, I fuck this up, I'm, you know, cooked. Like yeah. this has to, my next job has to be brilliant after getting fired from war games. Yeah. And that's why he's resistant. Cause he's like, this script seems off. The tone is weird. I don't want to do it. He rejects them multiple times. Eventually he decides because they keep badgering him. He will flip a coin mm -hmm. and yeah. he says he will adhere to the outcome. It came up head. So he said he'd do it. He starts working on it. And there's this big fight over like, look, this script is light Stallone wants something incredibly bloody and heavy. And two weeks in, Stallone's like, fine, I'm going to leave the project. Like right. Stallone loses in a way, or at least like they won't give on the script. And Stallone basically takes all the ideas of what he wanted Beverly Hills Cop to be and puts them onto Cobra. Makes Cobra. Cobra is like the mm -hmm. wild, unchained Cra id Crazy movie. violence. Crazy. Right. Yeah. Cobra's yeah, like just like, the premise is just like, what if this cop shot criminals right. to death until they were dead? <laughs> and to be clear, Cobra kind of rules. <laughs> yeah, but it's... But like, it's also like... He it's got like rocks in its head. Though. Yes. Like, <laughs> well, it, it, it doesn't make sense to put that energy onto the Beverly Hills cop premise. Whereas Cobra, he was just like, let's start from the ground up of just, we live in the most insane world possible. I cut pizza with a pair of scissors. Where are you guys on Stallone, actually? Do you guys like that sort of vibe too? The 80s mega action Stallone? Yeah, for me, like, I watched also Beverly Hills Cop when I was a kid. Right. So I was only yeah. like six years old or something like that. And for me, I could take it. The Stallone movies, it was, they were so violent that I had nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> they are nasty, especially yeah. that late 80s Stallone. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was I was a gigantic fan of Stallone and and Schwarzenegger. You know, those <laughs> wanted to be like them, working out. You know, want to be muscled. <laughs> um, no, the, the, Stallone. I love Stallone. But for me, for me, Stallone was a bit too violent. For some reason, his movie. Oh, I need to rewatch it. But I loved Schwarzenegger. But I felt like the Schwarzenegger movies I could handle. Because it was really funny sometimes. Sometimes yeah, except he was a bit lighter. Stallone was <laughs> yes. really rough. I had the feeling yes. it was dark the Schwarzenegger rough. movies have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. This guy is incongruous. He doesn't really make sense right. in no the world. No human being has ever looked like this before. Right. Right. Yeah. Stallone says, yeah, I read the script and it didn't really, you know, work for what I do. So I rewrote it to do what I do best. And by the time it was done, it looked like the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's been different. The funny Damn. thing is, like, Stallone coming right off of Rocky could have done a good Beverly Hills cop. When Roger Ebert was yeah. like, this guy's the it's new like Brando. It's like he's a blue collar guy. Right, right. right. He's yeah, this yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. like yeah. sad poet of the streets, right? Right. right. <laughs> like yeah, of the, the, fish, the fish out of water yeah. concept. Yeah. You know, but that's, right. that's it could have worked perfectly. 10 years prior. Right. By this point, he's pretty. By the 80s, he's trying to become as cartoonish as Schwarzenegger. Like he's looking to make himself in a weird way less human and more yeah. like yeah. sort of yeah, just yeah. pure icon which is wrong for this movie where the whole kind of secret sauce of this film is that like Axel Foley's a people person. Right. He knows how to connect to other people. You need someone who's like on the level. Yeah. And also also the fact that that you know it, it, he's an African American lead in an action movie like that, you know, or action comedy you know, or mainstream movie that it, it was not the 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 usual thing to do as a main character, and that's also why 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 Jerry and Dom, you know, were really like pioneers on that front. But also, if Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson had gone to Paramount, yeah, in 1983, and said, "Here's our premise: it's a 23 year old black cop in Beverly Hills," right? Paramount either would have said no. Or they would have said, here's $2 million to make that. <laughs> yes, This is right. not a major <laughs> movie. This will not play internationally, right? Like, they would have thrown all the old racist axioms at it. Right. And shut it down or shrunk it. The only way this movie gets made at this level with a black lead is what we're saying, which is the whole movie has been built and then the star is gone. And suddenly <laughs> everyone's like, we have this hole to fill. Can we, like, take a flyer? Exactly. They bring in Murphy. Now, Murphy obviously has done 48 Hours in Trading Places and he's done Delirious, his big stand-up special. And obviously yeah. he was on SNL. Right. I that's mean, that's all he's done so far. As basically. you guys said, absurdly young. The thing I say too often on this podcast because it never ceases to blow my mind. He starts stand-up when he's 15 or 16. He gets on SNL when he's 19. 48 Hours, he's 21. So good. To Trading Places, he's 22. Right. Uh, I guess Delirious comes out that same year. And Beverly Hills Cop, he's 23. And that run, basically, of four years from 1980 to 1984, you're like, well, this has undeniably become the most famous entertainer. 
But yeah. Paramount is like, this guy's a second banana. He's yeah. second banana in 48 hours. They claim he's one in trading places too. That's kind of a stretch. They're, but he's second build. two-handers. Right. Even if I would argue he steals both movies. Right. It's like they, they have the security in their minds of like, we're putting him next to an established white star. But Breast says basically like, we can, we're making a movie that can be the whole, the bar scene in 48 hours is the whole movie. Right. Like, which is obviously the big scene in 48 Hours where Eddie Murphy, like, uncorks. Like, yes. and pretends to be a cop. Right. And they're like, well, this can just be the movie. Like, we, we've, like, lucked into something sensational here. Yeah, and it's, as you guys are sort of getting at, it's like, it's hard to imagine this script making sense with a white guy in the center. Yeah. Like, everything that's sort of, like, subtextual about the sort of class commentary of it and the culture clash and all of that becomes so much more explicit when you just put Eddie Murphy in the center and you don't have everyone, like, say the thing. Right. right. Which is, yeah. when he it's, walks into a room, everyone gets a little bit nervous. Yeah, it's 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 the it makes it all edgy all yes. of a sudden by right. having Eddie Murphy in it. And you're also rooting for him to fuck with people. You, you want him to get away with a lie. You know? Yes. So it's, it, that's the thing. Yeah. It's also, yeah, just the, the, the gap between, you know, he's African-American from Detroit, from the ghetto, and with Beverly Hills, that, it, everything be, just amplifies. Yes. It, re, it reminds us of us, you know, like two punks yeah, the, from Belgium, <laughs> <yeah>. Moroccan. <laughs> yeah. you, drop, you drop us in that kind of world, whether it's in Belgium, you know, or, or in LA. Uh, yeah, that's why we really, really related to, to these characters, whether it's Axel Foley or Michael Marcus. Yeah, for me, really, the first time I came to LA, uh, we were driving through Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> Just had that scene in my mind. I was Eddie Murphy. I was Axel Foley. Like, right. oh shit! Yeah, <laughs> this right. is lifting up your sunglasses and checking out dogs, <laughs> <laughs> and also and the did... palm trees. <laughs> and, we, the pal and we didn't belong. We didn't belong. That's for sure. <laughs> Do you guys like still feel that way at all? I mean, your publicist was just saying that you you don't live in LA. That you're you're recording right now from there because you're on the beginning of your press tour for the new Bad Boys and everything. But like. You guys have now become very established in the industry. Do you still feel like that's its own world to you? Or do you feel more like at home in it? No, we still, yeah, we still live in, in Belgium. Like, like we still live in Brussels. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. close, in a pretty rough neighborhood for some reason. <laughs> but, it, yeah, but, it, <laughs> but it feels like home. Yeah, yeah. We, we need a bit of roughness. <laughs> yeah, a bit of roughness. So we know where reality is. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so and, and also just for us as directors, our, our career, our ideal career is to make movies, you know, here in LA, the big blockbusters, and then also independent, smaller movies around the world. I mean, not, right, you're kind of switching yeah. between, right? Not right, to blow right. too much yeah. smoke up your asses, but you guys have worked so much. You've been like doing so much shit the last five years. But the thing I respect the most is that you guys are truly doing the sort of like one for me, one for them alternation that yeah. so often like that used to be the model like oh it, you know people who like making both small personal stories and bigger studio films they use the bigger studio films to give themselves the cachet to like Soderbergh style do the smaller films in between and so often now someone gets hired onto something like Bad Boys for Life and then they just get stuck only making movies of that size over and over and over right. again you gotta make the next big thing over right. and over and right. you guys have already been flipping back and forth yeah, I think it's very important because you learn from both. You learn from the big, you know, Hollywood blockbusters, like on 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 a, on a technical level, and also how to handle or how to defend your ideas in front of twenty people. Yeah, um, and you get just you know the chance to to work with the biggest stars and 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 do big action sequences. And you use those the thing that we learned. We use that in more the European or the Belgian project, which we did with Rebel on a technical level. And at the same time, when you do a European project, you you take chances, you you do crazy stuff. You really like you know you 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 take risks, which you, you cannot really do in Hollywood on the same level. And but if the risks you know give you a reward and you and, it, and it's successful, well, you use that experience to push the Hollywood project a little bit to the limit so that it yeah. doesn't become a something generic. The two things feed each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How far out from filming started did Eddie get hired? Three weeks. Three wow. weeks out. And Insane. Basically, they oh, wow. retool, they push back filming another month, I think, to retool the script. But basically, Brass says, we did not have a script. We had plot. You know, we had like yeah. a story but it would truly be like Breast, Murphy, apparently Sam Simon, the Simpsons writer, oh, yeah. 
doing punch up day of and like it would truly be like the next scenes in a bar get a bar like it and it's like what happens in the bar and it's like we'll figure it out it feels like the way they shoot curb your enthusiasm where it's right. like they plot it out they know the scenes and they're like here's the end objective by the end of the scene larry has to piss this person off right. but with this movie it's like by the end of this scene axel has to get this piece of information it has to lead him to the next clue or whatever but every scene's basically being constructed on the fly yes and breast says they would almost always throw to eddie and be like, can you come up with something? And pretty much always liked what he came up with. Like, yeah. if they didn't have a line or if they didn't have some kind of way out of a story jam, Eddie Murphy would figure it out. They all talk about it. It's this one of these things where it's like everyone talks about it in a happy way because they made a good movie that was a huge hit. Yeah. I think it was probably <laughs> an incredibly frustrating movie to make. Like, like the, uh, back Eddie Murphy. Chaos. Right. Fun chaos. Yeah. yeah. Like, Eddie Murphy is obviously this, like, giant personality who's coming up with stuff. Bruckheimer and Simpson are not exactly the, like, you know, most hands-off producers. Yeah. Breast is a huge control freak. Yes. And... Uh, at one point, Petrie has this story where uh, he ran into Marty Brest like 30 years later and he says, I'm sorry if I was ever an asshole making that movie. And he says, I'm sorry if I was ever an asshole, but I don't remember you being an asshole. I remember you being headstrong. And I and Petrie's like, that was the right word. Everyone mm. was just very headstrong. Yeah. There have always been these sort of stories of like Brest maintaining some relative sense of cool on set and then getting to the editing room and losing his mind and being like, is any of this going to cut together? Right. Because it's so improvisational and also like Murphy is rarely doing the same thing on two takes, let alone like separate pieces of coverage. But it is one of those things where like a lot of this movie plays out in masters, plays out in like wide mm -hmm. shots, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. versus a lot of movies today that we're used to seeing, like comedies that are very improv-based, they start to mm -hmm. feel a little uh, isolating because you basically like cut to a close-up of one guy going on a 30-second improv run that feels like it has nothing to do with the rest of the movie, and then it cuts back to the wide shot because they don't have that run from right, any other angle. Right, they just let the camera roll, and he was like, do stuff. Right, yeah. Whereas this movie, in the one shot, you're almost always seeing Eddie come up with something and everyone react to him in real time. Yeah, how do you guys approach it? Because, like, you're doing bad boys. Like, I assume Martin does a lot of that kind of stuff, right? Like, or is it not? Is it more tightly controlled these days? Well, it's. it's I think it's mostly in the rehearsals, actually, yeah, the that... Rehearsals. Uh, Right. That it's makes in sense. the rehearsals that we do like uh, you know we, we talk about the, the the scene and then we start they start to improv and then we adapt it in the in the screenplay but once we're on set everything is like you know we don't have the time to you know play around and yeah. and, and and then and that's when uh, we shoot what we have done in the rehearsals but because they, re they they improv so much during the rehearsal, it still has that vibe of spontaneity and sometimes it's just like one day or two days before we are about to shoot. But when once we have it, once we we have like a couple of takes that are like according to what we rehearsed, we always let them just you know yeah, take all <laughs> go local, yeah. and then then they always come up with like some happy accidents. Right, That's pretty fun. Well, they've also been playing these characters right. for like close to thirty years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have a lot of experience on that, and a lot of comedic experience. Yeah, you're right. Just on other movies too. Right on, like having the movie on your shoulders like that. I think with breast, it's like. He's very methodical. He's very OCD. That's part of why he gets dismissed from war games, probably. Is yep. they're like, this process makes no sense. I, you know, Ryan, Judge Reinhold says that he would do things like be like, perfect, that was perfect. Let's do one more day. <laughs> and everyone would be like, what is the matter with you? Yeah. But I, I think he, Breast knows he has to pull back a little bit and let more chaos in because he just got fired. That's what I was going to say. There's like some weird kind of like agreed upon BDSM in the process of making this movie <laughs> where Breast is like choosing to allow himself to be a little tortured by creating a circumstance that he knows he cannot fully control. But also probably his control tendencies are keeping things a little bit more on rails than anyone else would. Yeah, because and Reinhold says this too, that Marty would like push past dick jokes. Like when Tony Scott is making mm -hmm. Beverly Hills Cop 2 and Eddie does a dick joke, Tony Scott loves the dick joke. The yeah. dick joke stays in. Marty pushed Eddie past dick jokes. Like to do like, let's get more charactery with it probably, right? Like that's why the movies feel different. Yeah. Again, I yeah. uh, I like Beverly Hills Cop too, but it's a broad movie. It's this very, is a less it, broad movie. Yes. It's, I, I compare Beverly Hills Cop one and two a little bit like Bad Boys one and two. <laughs> yeah, although it's yep. although it's, nope, it's both made by Michael true. Bay, but you got like <laughs> yeah. uh, somehow the first one is like the restraint, you know, more classic Michael Bay. Like we we don't go too crazy, and then Bad Boys two it just goes 
off the rails, yeah, like extra, extra, extra large. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bad Boys Two <laughs> is one of the most yes, vulgar, crazy. I love yeah. Bad Boys Two to be clear, but it is so <laughs> over the top. It's amazing. Yeah, and you kind of have that with with Beverly Hills Cop too, which is, which yeah, I I love both of them. But the, you know, Martin Brest has really like this. If, is it when you watch the movie, it's very efficient. You know, yes. the first Beverly Hills Cop, it it comes. It, it the movie shot in ninety eighty four, so it, it it comes still from that classic um, that classic way of filmmaking, mm-hmm. uh, where where a lot of things are in one shot. You know, uh, uh, because that's what they used to do. Obviously, also with the thirty five millimeter uh, uh, stock that you use, that that you cannot. You know, digitally mm-hmm. you you can do whatever, but there you had to be efficient. This is the take, and and you see how well the blocking is of the characters and the actors and. And, and and how they move and and that's why that's why it's like it's a clean and lean and mean movie the first one and that's that's pretty amazing that's where you really see how talented the director uh, Martin Brest is. I also think as as we were sort of saying earlier, a lot of action comedies, if the character is funny, you don't believe them within the real stakes of the movie, mm. and if you believe them within the stakes, they're not funny. Right. It's hard to hit the midpoint. Right? How do we make mm-hmm. this guy seem like a professional? Right, and and that well, he, still he's funny. Still. He's funny right. to the audience, and that in the world of the movie, people are reacting to him appropriately. If yeah. he's making a joke, well, the fact that Axel's biggest skill is that he can talk his way into places, yes, is funny. Yeah, but you're also like that's a competency. Like that's he's good at that. But, but like that's you a set skill. It up so well at the beginning with him and the chief in Detroit, right. his sergeant. Uh, who, like, he's trying to talk his way out of situations like that. And right. Sergeant's like, I'm so fucking tired of the Axel Foley thing. I'm getting the <laughs> right. Axel Foley thing every goddamn day. Right. I get it. Your cute <laughs> little jokes. And, like, one of the biggest laughs in the movie for me is when he's yelling at him about, like, the truck and this and all of that, and you cause this much damage. And he goes, that's your side of the story. And he goes, well, then what's your side of the story, Foley? And Eddie takes, like, a 10-second pause and then goes, let's hear your side first. I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Yeah. He's such a good listener in this movie, which is a thing that often is not the case with major comedy stars where they're yeah. just like, I got to score in every scene. I got to keep the movie afloat. Like Eddie really listens to what everyone says, which I think is the key to believing that he's actually a detective. You know the deal with Gil Hill, right? The guy who plays the, the, the boss. No. He's a real cop. He was in law enforcement his whole life. The only movies he ever made are Beverly Hills Cop 1, 2, and 3. Wow. And then he ran for mayor of Detroit in 2001 and almost won. Like, lost to Kwame Kilpatrick, who turned out to be a massively corrupt mayor who went to prison. (laughs) Um, But, like, that's why that guy... That guy is so serious. Yes. And like really does feel like he wants to be rid of Eddie Murphy. Like yes. he is not just the the stereotype chief who's like, all right, you're a pain in my ass. I mean, what you guys did with Joey Pants in Can we talk Bad about Boys Joey 3. Pants for like, a second. Mm-hmm. That is... He's a serious guy. And like, he's funny. He's a great actor. He's incredibly like warm comedic actor. But like, that feels like a real person. David and I are both obsessed with that performance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Joey Pants, legend. Yeah, he is a legend. The King, I I walked out of that movie, I texted David, and I said, this is exactly who I want to age into as an actor. (laughs) My dream is I could just someday do what Joey Pants does in Bad Boys 3. Yeah. Yeah. Joey Pants is, and we when when we talked with him uh, recently, we said, Joey, you know, you you work with Steven Spielberg and Chris Nolan and the Wachowski siblings. And and now with us, isn't that like devolution? Like, isn't like, <laughs> look, like look how your career turned into now with two punks like us. <laughs> and what did he say? No, no, he, he actually he didn't answer. <laughs> no, he talked about he talked about some stories about the Goonies, and I was like, uh, all right, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he agrees. <laughs> see that. <laughs> but he's a guy like uh, Midnight Run, uh, sure. Running Scared. Yeah. Uh, certainly his work in the Bad Boys movies where it's like he can be consistently incredibly funny and play the stakes of every scene. He's never yeah, selling yeah. out the story for a joke. No. That's also what's, what's so good about just, you know, Martin Bress work as yeah. a director. If you, you know, Midnight Run and and and, um, and uh, Beverly Hills Cop and also, you know, the going in style where there's a good balance between going between 
comedy and seriousness. And that is a difficult balance to have. There's not a lot of, like nowadays, it seems to be harder and harder to have like sometimes a dramatic scene or a serious scene and then having a comedic scene. It's like really one way or the other. Yeah. And and not a lot, of, a lot of actors are capable of doing that. Like Joey Panzi is perfectly in that. He, he can be so funny and then there's something serious. Or Will and Martin or, you know, Eddie for that matter. And and that's that tone that, that's really specific to to what Don Don Simpson and Jerry and and Martin Brist like you know for for us that's a blueprint for all the movies that that came after that. This movie basically starts like a more conventional action comedy. I mean, you have like Eddie undercover. You later find out he was not approved to go undercover. He did this of his own choice, right? Pretending to be a drug dealer in the back of this truck, and it like starts out and he's in character doing like. Basically doing Rudy Valentine. Yeah. Doing like mile a minute, fast talking, wheeler dealer guy in a bus that goes wrong. And this truck is plowing through Detroit and causing all this damage. And it's like the classic Bruckheimer Simpson bombast. And then you get to the fucking precinct and it's like, you're in a real world now. This guy's off the mm -hmm. clock. Right. It's Billy Ray Valentine. Yeah. I was like, Rudy Valentine. I'm sorry, Billy Ray Valentine. Uh, yeah, or his 48 Hours character or whatever, yeah. right. But yes, he is He is being Eddie Murphy as a cop in Detroit and everyone in Detroit is sick of it. Um, but he's not even like basically fired and he's not even totally in trouble until James Russo gets killed. Right. And James, that's when it's like, you know what? Get out of here. Yeah. James Russo is so good in this. This he feels is. like the big Martin Brest is decision. The best friend, right. Of Mikey. like, Really spend like eight minutes with the two of them. Right. Let them actually establish that they're buddies before it's just like, oh, my my friend's dead. Yeah. Don't just have it be like this scene exists for exposition later. Really, the purpose of this scene is chemistry, is like establishing a sense of history and intimacy so that the rest of the movie, you understand where he's coming from because he's never going to, in the script, have a scene where he like breaks down crying and says like, they killed my friend. I have to solve this case. It all is kind of just under the hood with him. And there's the moment where they're at the bar and like this relationship, there's so much you learn about him without it having to be stated of like these two guys grew up together as children and were probably committing low level crimes together. Right. And then Axel went straight and he did not. And Axel has maintained this relationship with his childhood best friend who is like a very low level, I wouldn't even say criminal, but like a guy who exists in sort of the back alleys of the world is constantly getting caught up in like low-level schemes or being like, you know, hey. muscles for things. And then there's the scene in the bar in the, like the billiards hall where they tell the story about James Russo getting busted for the first time when they sent him to state school. And Axel says, I never understood why didn't you rat me out? And James Russo goes, you don't know? And there's like a long pause between the two of them. And then he goes, because I love you, man. Well. But it feels like the subtext of the scene is he's like, they would have gone harder on you than they did on me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's not stated directly. Right. It's unspoken, but it's right. It's right there. And it sort of feels like it's subtextually part of why Axel became a cop. Where it's yeah. like him running the exact same level of shit as James Russo would have ended with him in jail or dead much sooner because of the society we live in. He kind of had to yeah, go yeah, straight. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like he's, it's like he saved his life basically. Yeah, and that's yes. that's why that's why this is also so important for that character to to find out who killed him and and catch the bad guys basically. Exactly. And the fact that he doesn't even say it, but you get the sense that Axel kind of processes it for the first time and instead it's just I love you. And then like 3 minutes later, he is just so unceremoniously knocked out by Jonathan Banks. Great Jonathan yes. Banks. <laughs> yeah. With hair. Yeah. Yeah, with hair. With, yeah, with hair. Black hair. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Holding Mike, on for dear life. Michael Champion as uh, Zach as the other guy, right? Or something like that. But Zach and... No, no. Banks is Zach. Sweet scene of like Foley bringing back his best friend drunk at his door. And then right. all of a sudden they basically knock, knock him out. Eddie out of frame. He just falls out of frame. Yeah. This horrifying scene plays out. They shoot this guy point blank. And the next thing you know, he's like in the back of the ambulance. Seen the crime, his sergeant comes in. He's like, I know what you're fucking thinking. Don't turn this into your case. Right. The one thing he heard was that, what's James Russo's character's name? Uh, Mikey. That he had been working in Beverly Hills as a security guard at this art gallery. And Axel just says, like, I'm going on vacation. 
it's my break. I'm in Beverly Hills. And then you're straight in. I mean, we're like 15, 20 minutes into the movie now. Yeah, something like that. 20 minutes, 20, 25, I think. Or something like that. that's, um, yeah. that's sufficient. <laughs> it's sufficient. <laughs> and he just like hits the fucking ground running, right? I mean, he basically, he goes straight to the art gallery. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really good how much breast lingers, like you say, in the early part of the movie. In Detroit, the great opening credits where it's just like street scenes and people walking around, the friendship, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Reiser is there. That's true. Um, yes. And then it's like the cop, you know, the boss being like, hey, don't you do it. Eddie Murphy being like, I'm going to do it. We're in Beverly Hills. And he's marching right into a hotel being like, hey, oh, I'm right, a writer from Rolling first. Stone. But right. it's immediately like such a change in color palette. Like Brest is so good at how he establishes the look of Detroit versus Beverly Hills cop. So the moment you cut to like, the palm trees whirling by outside the car window. It feels like an absolute culture shock. I still know very little about Beverly Hills. Everything I know about Beverly Hills is from movies. I've been there like once in my life, like for a, an afternoon or something. I feel like this movie's pretty accurate, right? It is pretty much still like that. You know? Four years like, later, like, exactly it's like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you know when when when, when we saw the trailer of of, uh, of you know, Beverly Hills Cop Four now, uh, directed by Mark Malloy, we. We saw it and it's like, okay, it's like nothing has changed. Yeah, it still right. has the same vibe. Like if you watch that trailer or you, know, you watch the first movie um, and, and you will just, you know, drive around Beverly Hills, it, it is that. It, it didn't, it never changed, which is pretty amazing, actually. I guess, yeah. He really captured uh, what Beverly Hills is. If you go that, like you saw it only in the movies, but if, uh, if you see it in real life, it's just the same. It's as if you're walking yeah. into the movie, basically. Yes. Yeah. When you walk in Beverly Hills. Yeah, it does. Right. Real Beverly Hills feels like a Disney World recreation of the location from Beverly Hills Cop. Like when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. It's just a little Disney. <laughs> it's like it's this tiny Center. little like neighborhood. Yeah. I know yeah. it's a city onto itself or whatever, but it's like really just like this little neighborhood. Right. It's like the little Mexico in Epcot. But I, when I was a kid, I didn't get why it was crazy that there was a Beverly Hills Cop. I didn't either. I knew that it was crazy or it was fun that Eddie Murphy was a cop. Like, and I knew, I guess I knew he was a fish out of water. I remember my father having to explain Obviously, to me at later, some age. there's a Beverly Hills ninja. He's right. a kung fu. I, anytime I didn't get a joke in anything, I right. would ask my father to completely unpack it for me. Whether it right. was like a specific joke or what is this even riffing on. And I remember him having to explain to me, like, there are stereotypes about what people from certain cities are like. Like, I didn't understand. Like, well, what? So he's from one city and he goes to a different city. And he's yeah. like, no, at Beverly Hills, they're really snooty. And I was right. like, everyone in Beverly Hills? They're snooty and they're pretentious. Superficial. Right. And like, how else to describe? They're like, kind of like, they've got this kind of cutting edge fashionista vibe that is kind of annoying, I guess. Like, well, the, and the, then the they're, very, they're, they're very, very white, I would say. <laughs> and they are a little white. A That's little a good bit, point. A tiny bit. <laughs> yeah, and and I just also see when I see Beverly Hills, it's like uh, it's money. <laughs> You've got like this cadre of like Ronnie Cox, who obviously is just like an incredible like suit that you yes. just you just hate the guy's face the second you see it. Yeah, even though he's not as bad in this. Like, no, this starts to create the model that right, the Verhoeven Robocop riffs thing. on right. of like, can we crank you up to twenty seven? <laughs> right. John Ashton as like like the take no guff like personality free like jerk, mm -hmm. and then Reinhold is kind of like the good boy. Yes, who you're kind of like, well, he seems like a sweetie pie, but he's also like he's like a vanilla sandwich. He's like nothing, right? You don't you yeah. don't detect a lot of guts to judge Reinhold. But the scene in this movie that feels so ahead of its time is when Eddie gets thrown out the window. They arrest him. They bring him to the precinct. They realize that he's a cop, and then Ronnie Cox comes in. And starts doing basically the like HR speech. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you exactly. like to press after, charge? after after John Ashton? Yeah, has uh, punched him in the in the stomach. Right, and you're just watching like Axel in real time watch this conversation play out. Right. So confused, he's he doesn't like, talk I, for like a cops minute. Cops don't report each other for like fighting in the office, like where I'm from. Like, right. what are you and, talking and about? And he's not even stating that as like this is a moral code that cops don't turn on other cops. Right. He's just like, what are you? What are you saying? <laughs> My my chief constantly slaps me. <laughs> Everyone's yelling at each other. <laughs> right. You start with the the hotel, yeah, which the hotel is the beginning really funny. of like a, another one of these things that I it gets intensified as the Beverly Hills Cop movies go on. But like him, sort of affecting characters, a low level Fletch, if you will. 
Yeah, it's Fletchy. That's a good point, actually. It is. It's like Chevy Chase. But um, like I said, it's a skill that feels actually relevant to his job. Yes. It's not like, oh, Eddie Murphy, the actor is here now. Yeah. To play a new character for us for two minutes and it'll be funny. It's like, nah, this guy can talk himself like b- into a situation I could not do. Also, he knows how to read people right. so fast. He understands what sort of persona to apply to get through that specific person. He's sort of like mm-hmm. tailor making the the improv exercises to the end objective and who's in the environment and everything. But another great like silent Eddie reaction moment is when he's sort of. I have a reservation. Your reservation's not on file. Rolling Stone. He starts throwing out the thing. Clearly, this is a race issue. And then the manager comes in, who's also a lot of RoboCop actors used in this movie, or I guess RoboCop (laughs) uses a lot of these actors. This guy is the hostage negotiator from RoboCop, the manager of the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the guy promising the car with really shitty mileage. Right, 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 right. And he goes like, I'm so sorry, sir. We will give you one of our luxury suites for the price of the regular hotel room. And Axel's like so happy that he pulled this off. And he goes, great, how much? He goes, only $232 a night. Right, right. Which (laughs) For for that time, which is a lot of fucking money. Right. Yeah. And you see him in real time go like, I can't afford this. (laughs) Right. But I've talked myself into it. I'm just going to say yes and figure it out. (laughs) Right. It makes the character iconic and very smart, you know. So, so that's that's why you remember Beverly Hills Cop. It's not just you know a generic good cop. It's it's that what makes him so specific and what makes it so Eddie Murphy specific. Yeah, and like he cares, right? Like there's there's a feeling of this guy believes in some sort of moral right. Sure, in, in a low level way. Yeah, you mean yeah, Axel? Sure, yeah. Right. Like, it's not like a quest for vengeance. There, There is a version of this movie. It's probably a Stallone version of this movie of like, you killed my best friend. Everyone's going to pay. Yeah, right. Right. right and right. he's just mowing people down. It's your classic just sort of like revenge thing. This is like, he hates that his friend is dead, but he also hates this type of person who moves through the world with impunity. Right. And a sense of superiority. I love how straightforward the villain is. Stephen Burkoff, to be clear. You know, like, right. Where it's just like, he's just like, I don't have to worry about these people. Like, I'm rich. I can buy my way out of the situation. That's it. This is all just like game, a game for me. Right. Yeah. Victor Maitland. Victor Maitland. Victor Maitland. Great Maitland. name. Sitting there behind the desk. Yeah. Will, 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 uh, Will Smith would always like during uh, the last Bad Boys movie talk about that. Yeah, we need a bad guy like Victor Maitland. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Cool. That is interesting. Yeah. Straightforward, blue eyed, just, just bats. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the <laughs> villain in the what movie? We have. It's uh, Eric Dane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yes. Uh, Eric Dane. Who perfect. It's like exactly the same. It's, you know, it's really like, like Will worked a lot on the script and, yeah. and he really designed the bad guy as a Victor Maitland bad guy. So mm-hmm. when, you know, powerful and gets away with everything, isn't really on a high level and is so serious and dark and not comedic at all and... And I think, yeah, I think if you, you're a fan of Beverly Hills Cop 1 and, and Victor Maitland, you recognize the maybe the son of Victor Maitland. Who knows? <laughs> you know, if there's, maybe one day we'll do a shared universe uh, movie <laughs> called, called, called The Bruckheimer Verse and uh, we'll bring uh, Axel Foley together with Mike and Marcus. I mean, yeah, that was, Troy, yeah, there's, Cameron Poe. Yeah, right. Get them all in there. Multiple yeah. cages. Right. But this guy also, like, his heartbeat never... Yeah, increases. it's like this guy is barging in being like, hey, my friend was killing. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Like, that's such bad news. But he, he, nothing I can do for right, you on that. Right. Right. Yeah. He's got that sort of like absurd, like Epstein level. Like, I will buy myself out of every situation. There is nothing you can threaten yeah. me with that's going to fucking do anything that's going to move the needle an inch. It's like, I feel like now I'm trying to remember the plot of the later Beverly Hills Cops because like, there's no mystery to this movie. We know who did it. Yeah. We watch the murder happen. Right. It's just about like, can Axel like break through these structures to get yes. what needs the to happen? The major villain done. of the film is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, racism, rich people, privilege, shit like that. Right. You right. know, the just rules like of society. Can he get the Beverly Hills cops to pay attention to him and yeah. accept him? Can he get, you know, these villains to reveal themselves and get taken down. Like, that's it, really, right? Right, because he finds the coffee grounds early and everyone's like, coffee grounds? Who gives a shit? It's coffee. And he's just like, you don't have, coffee's used to disguise drugs. 
Right. Like, he doesn't have anything he can throw at him, but he knows he's right. Jenny, in the in the film, uh, the female lead, who is sort of childhood friends with Axel and Mikey, it is one of these fascinating things where, he's like... He's a backer. Who didn't do much after this. I think it's very good in this movie. She's very charming. Yeah. Um, but she's talked about, like, she was supposed to be the love interest in the movie, cast against Stallone. Then when Eddie comes in instead... They're immediately like, well, the two of them can't end up together romantically because the audience will get upset. Right. Uh, just like absolute high level Hollywood racism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that does create this interesting effect of like, if if only for bad reasons starting out, it is fascinating that this is one of the only movies of its ilk in which there is no romantic relationship. There's just a man and a woman who are friends. That's cool. It yeah, is yeah. cool. That's actually good. It's, very, it's actually very <laughs> yeah. modern now, nowadays. It's actually very hard not not to you know to, to create that. You know exactly. That, that, it's right. like that's the insane. Yeah, thing. you really feel their friendship. So and and the friendship that she has with with the uh, with the guy who got who got killed. Yeah, because they grew up together. So you you they they all concerned by that. But it's this weird. Ha it's like another happy accident thing with this movie of like you only get that result because of bigotry. <laughs> And racial fear. Yeah. But the yeah. end result of it, as you said, does feel weirdly modern even still. And it like changes the whole tenor of like types of scenes you don't see in a movie like this, which is just people playing old friends who are familiar with each other. Yeah. And without the tension of like, are they going to kiss? Yeah, it still feels fresh. That's why it still feels so fresh when you see it today uh, in the movie. It's my favorite performance moment. Uh, Eddie has in the entire film mm -hmm. is when uh, Axel comes in and says like so I, I saw Mikey the other day and she makes some comment like oh no what kind of trouble is he up to now right and they cut back to Axel and he has this long response time where he debates whether or not to deliver it as a joke or not right right mm -hmm. there's like the jokey version of like a uh, real trouble he's dead you know like turning into yeah. some kind of punchline which this type of character in a movie often would. And you see him weigh it and then go like, he died. Like, this is not a time to joke. Yeah, this, this movie has a lot of moments where they don't go for the easy joke. And you're still laughing and you still like it because you love these characters. We're making it sound like an understated art movie. It is still a broad oh, comedy I, right. about it. <laughs> Eddie Murphy is yeah, a cop. It is, but compared to what, what movies today or when yeah. you think about action comedy, it, it is much more artistic yes. uh, uh, than, than, you know, than you would remember it, it because the, the, yeah, the, the serious and dramatic scenes are, are real and are earnest and, and, um, and are, you know, are very subtle, you would say. So, so it's, it's quite a sophisticated movie if you watch it today and, and that's not the same as um, as just a brainless, you know, yeah. cash grab blockbuster where where everything is a bit too artificial. You know, it it feels authentic. That's that's what that make that made that movie also, I think, so successful back in the days. There's there's a real center to the guy, and it makes it all the funnier when he does shit like the fucking bananas in the tailpipe. <laughs> Which yeah. like when yeah. I was nine and seeing this for the first time, that I got. I was like, well, this guy rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the with the <laughs> shrimp salad sandwich. <laughs> Did this movie yeah. invent the banana in the pale tailpipe? Like this is huh. entirely Beverly Hills Copper. Was that some kind of a prank that existed? And Eddie's just like, you know what, I'm gonna do classic banana in the tailpipe. Honestly, I never saw that. No, no, no I mean I only I, saw it from the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I never, I never saw that. It, and, and also, I, I wonder if people after that movie, you know, did that. If there was an yeah. epidemic. It probably was. Does yeah, it, yeah. Does People it really definitely block the car. In, in tail <laughs> does it work? <laughs> it's another great moment where he gets the bananas from uh, Damon Wayans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. short. He's the banana short man. Scene. Yeah, yes. very short. Yeah, yeah. Also one shot. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but at a time where like there were not a lot of black stars in Hollywood, Eddie, is, especially with the movies coming after this, was famous for like pulling guys from the stand-up circuit. Yeah. Yeah, who can I get into, yeah. like, Coming to America or Golden Child or whatever, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you got the short Damon Wayne scene where he just wants the bananas for the tailpipe, and he asks how much, and Damon Wayne says that they're part of, like, a $25 fruit plate. Right. With, like, three <laughs> peaches and four plums and whatever. And then Eddie just sort of silently gives him the take without even pushing back or saying yeah. anything, and Damon Wayne's is kind of like... Oh, here's just three bananas. Don't say anything. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm with you. This is an absurd product. <laughs> Neither of us belong in Beverly Hills, you know? But 
Yeah. Right after that is the strip club scene. Like, what is it? How yeah. does that? How does this? I mean, yeah. uh, Rosewood and Taggart are like uh, doing the stakeout outside the hotel, which he sends them the food. Right. <laughs> That's the other. The dynamic of like Ashton always being like, "Dude, this is guys fucking with us," and Reinhold always being like, "It's a good burger." Right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> very. It's very. He's a good guy. The naive good guy, right. which we love. Yeah, we know? love that. <laughs> even when he's being fucked with, and even when Ashton's telling him to keep his head on a swivel, he's like, "Yeah, but we're getting a free burger out of it." Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> always. He's a sunny boy. He always sees something positive yes. in every situation, <laughs> which is a strength. It's a superpower. Right, and you get this great antagonism of like, uh, he's he's now learned the difference of the Beverly Hills Cop culture how strictly by the book these guys are going to operate under Ronnie Cox um, and how much these guys are going to be on his case trying to stop him from solving it himself. And he starts this like playful antagonism with them that slowly becomes an actual friendship. Yeah, it goes from the stakeout to the strip club, basically. Right. And the strip club is kind of where they start to bond. I mean, obviously, one of the most iconic gifts ever, uh, Eddie doing the AOK sign. Yeah. I feel like yeah. this <laughs> That's a shot. Um, but and what I also love about that scene is that when you know he's joking around and, and trying to make friends with them, but then all of a sudden there is really threat, and you see how Eddie changes and yes. assesses the situation, and it right. becomes real. So that again, it makes it so grounded. Any, yeah. I remember uh, Eddie Murphy's uh, Inside the Actor Studio, which is incredibly good. And unlike a lot of comedians who would like get movie roles in this era, especially someone who's fucking 23 years old, who's doing their first movie when they're 21. If you come from a comedy background, you show up and all you're thinking about is, I just want to score. I want to be as funny as I can in every scene. And Eddie was always like clearly a student of movies, obsessively watched movies and TV as a kid, was obsessed with actors, like processed the story weight of what he needed to convey in every scene and not just being funny. And inside the actress, too, he's talking about how obsessively he studied, like, Charles Lawton's Hunchback of Notre Dame when he was a kid. Right. Like, his influence is being so varied. Mm -hmm. But the thing he said that I always remember whenever I rewatch Beverly Hills Cop is he said, anytime I'm holding a gun in Beverly Hills Cop, I'm doing Bruce Lee. Mm. <laughs> and it wasn't Bruce Lee during, like, the fights. It's Bruce Lee when he enters a room and he's trying to suss yeah. out the level of danger. Right, 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 right. And it's, yes. it's it's what you just said of like in that scene he's joking around he's having fun and then there's a moment where he really locks in yeah. and it's like are we on the same page are you giving me real information you know like the bit is dropped yeah. yes yeah all of a sudden the situation is real and yeah she just got real <laughs> yeah uh, it just so shows him also what a good cop he is yes <laughs> yeah he's he's credible you know like when he when he's with a gun like super serious focused he feels dangerous and and that's like an amazing switch to do you know between between yeah you, know, you know it's a funny guy it's fun to watch him but then he became he becomes an action action hero he becomes a really serious you know dangerous guy for the bad guys what's wild i mean the real like magic act is he he reads as dangerous without ever feeling like he's trying to play tough right yeah which I think you get that a lot with action comedy is if the guy's background is in comedy first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it's like, well, let me add like 80 pounds of muscle. Let me flex. Let me clench my jaw. You know? Like, I got to yeah. get more serious in kind of a cool guy way. Versus like, what becomes dangerous about him is like, his focus. Yes. The, the way he holds the gun, you know, that's like, it's, it's, it became like, an, you, you see that in the trailer uh, of the last Beverly Hills Cop, that's the, maybe even the first shot of him, mm -hmm. like the way he, he holds the gun is like, okay, it's, it's, it's dangerous, it's also super cool, but it feels real. Seeing the trailer for the fourth yeah. one, I was like, when the trailer dropped, I'm like gripping onto my armrest being like, is Eddie going to get it right? Like, is he going to remember the specifics of Axel versus his other characters? And it is like some of the stuff, like just some the body language in that, the way he looks at people, the way he listens. And even when he's motor mouthing, it's like at a, a sort of quieter volume. Um, he never like 48 hours is a bigger, broader performance than this, even though it's before. He's boisterous. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so, and, and trading is places is a little he's more huge. subtle. <laughs> yeah, trading places is he's huge. That's a big movie in, right. in every way. Yes. <laughs> this is probably his best movie star performance, I would say. It, it is the one that, like, quantifies everything. 
Mm-hmm. Now I'm wondering if that's a hot take, but I do think it's true. Like, obviously, I love a lot of other Eddie performances, but they're, you know, bigger comic perform. Like this, yeah, this is probably the definitive Eddie Murphy star performance, right? Yes. Yeah. Now I'm like, am I crazy? No, I'm he's not crazy. Coming off of no, two big, I would, I would say so. Yeah, I would right. agree with that. Yeah. So yeah. he's coming yeah, off because of, it's it's, sorry, it's the on. movie that. Oh, sorry. It, it's just like it's like Harrison Ford with Indiana Jones. Yes. Yeah. You know, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's you know those are one of the iconic characters, and it was with that first movie. So I think that that makes sense. He's coming off of two big hit movies where he gives incredible performances, but this is the one that like solidifies him in history. This is the one that makes him the biggest star for the rest of the 80s, basically. And this is the one where it's like he's he's put all the pieces together in a movie that's really just about him. Yeah. Um, and it's also yeah. it's also a character that is connected to to a music. And you don't have that a lot, you know? So that's the iconic track. To have your own F theme. Track. And a theme this recognizable. And a theme that basically any child can do yes. on a keyboard like because yes. it's just dun, 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 dun. You, like you can actually figure it out by it's got yourself that thing like the jaws yeah, you... theme where its simplicity is right. part of its power yes but then yeah. when it goes into yeah. the dun, 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 dun. right well then right it gets yeah. cool right yeah. the... i love it i love those 80 sounds <laughs> harold feltemeyer <laughs> guys king. that's he's the main yeah he is the king that's yeah i mean yeah, it's, it's so funny it's like it's you know it's a real scene and and but then you have that 80s dance music. <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> it gives you goosebumps. It's it's something you know, chemical in your in your brain that happens when you see that. So that yeah, that's why, you know, you don't have a lot of characters that are connected with 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 music. No. And 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 one actor. Yeah, and it's anymore. also something typical for 80s and 90s movies. Yeah. We don't have that really anymore. Yeah. We don't. We don't have enough themes. No. We need more themes. No, and it's like yeah. in the way that when you hear like hearing Danny Elfman's Batman theme for the first time, I, I invoke this a lot, but where I'm just like, yeah, that's what Batman sounds like musically. This yeah. is the perfect Axel Foley theme because it's both like a little bit intense and cool and a little bit goofy and funny. Right, right. It has both sides of him in it. Yeah, so on that note, growing up as a kid, <laughs> you had Axel Foley with the, the music and then you had Michael Keaton with the Batman team. Yeah. And let's say at a certain <laughs> point in our careers, yeah. it was a very difficult choice to make whether we would do Beverly Axel Hills Cup Foley, or, right? Oh yeah, or Batgirl, or, or, or Michael Keaton as Batman. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eventually, we didn't do none of them. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do any of them. I mean, we did one of them. Well, but, uh, Michael then, is all over Batgirl, right? I know, you know, like yeah. we'll never yeah. see it, I guess. But like, he's he's the big supporting sort of mentor in it, right? Yeah, he was there and he was, you know, he was like sort of mentor. And obviously we had, uh, you know, in in the cut of, in a cut of the movie that nobody's <laughs> going to see, we had the Danny Elfman score theme at that moment, yeah. you know, which was pretty dope. So when we were shooting that. I felt back like a five-year-old kid. So, <laughs> but yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, yeah, it's so weird that, right, like, whatever. I mean, you guys, I'm sure have discussed it to death. Just that there's a movie out there like I like that I could just go steal like you know and I have to like break into a vault to watch it. Well, maybe one day we'll make a heist movie yeah, out of exactly that. You know, about... after after Bad Boys <laughs> Ride or Die, just one big heist right, <laughs> movie right. about that story. You just put some code into a streaming service and then it's there. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, back to uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. The strip club. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're starting a bond. Mm-hmm. Ashton, like, and they he plays it perfectly, breast. Yes. This sort of slow admiration. Yeah. They're not like, this guy's actually great and we're on board with him entirely, but they are kind of like suddenly sticking up for him with Ronnie Cox a little bit, right? Yes. Like, they're yes. kind of like, eh, you know, he might have, you know, he might have an idea of what to do here. And, um, and, and Rosewood gets there faster than Taggart does. Uh, yes, Rosewood being Reinhold, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably because he is a little more open. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. A bit, a bit younger. Yeah, like yes. they feel like the same generation. Even though I think that Dagger, I don't know what what age he was during the. I think he's our age, or I think maybe we're even older than him. And for some reason, it looks like Dagger. No, no, I think he's he's like no. Nah, I think I think Dagger was beginning thirty. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. In the John 80s, Ashton, everybody looked. Yeah, good. I was going to say, is one of those actors who has looked forty his yeah. entire career. I think he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like that. astonishingly. Right. I think he's about thirty-five years old in this movie. That, that seems. Cool. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah, born yeah, in 1940. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He would have been like thirty-six. 36 yeah. Or thirty. Yeah. 
That's no, he seems well, like fifty five. Kind of the same me. age yeah. as you. <laughs> yeah, David. I hope I don't. You know, I mean, with all due respect, great actor, great. Actor. No, he's a great actor. Reinhold's like in his mid twenties. Reinhold's like kind of yeah. twenty five, twenty six when but he makes this other, movie. You you look at John Ashton in the in the Beverly Hills Cop four trailer, and he basically looks the same. Like exactly the flip side the of this is yet. when he yeah. was twenty, he looked forty five, but right. now he's seventy five and he looks forty five. I mean, <laughs> God bless that he's in it. He's still kicking. John Ashton, yeah. seventy six years old. Yeah. All right. So yeah, then they right they this they they find the coffee grounds. Right. Mm -hmm. He sneaks into a whale and into the warehouse. Then there's the sort of country club scene. Right. Is that is that like the, yeah, the fight also, with Jonathan? We didn't Banks. talk about Bronson Pinchot. We didn't talk about Bronson Pinchot. That the one time the movie is kind of like, can we hit pause for two minutes just to be funny? Yeah. Like, you know, like, can we just actually like have a little comic scene play out? Which Pinchot had like a comedy background, but was hired basically as a dramatic actor to play the straight version of this character. Right. And I thought he was going to do the straight version. My of wife this was immediately like, this is funny. And I yeah. was like, this is so funny. It fucking made a guy's career, it's man. Like, he got multiple sitcoms <laughs> off of this. And then right. it also becomes the thing where like in Beverly Hills Cop 2, they're like, we're proud to present Gilbert Godfrey in the Bronson Pinchot position. Right, right. They start to build these movies with like, and there's the one scene where he's going to have the electric back and forth with the new comedy guy. And then he's back in three, right? They're like, don't worry, Serge is back. He's back in two, is he not? Doesn't he give him the guns in two? Doesn't he become an arms dealer? I think that's three. No, no, that, that's in three. That's yeah. in three. Okay. That's for sure. Yeah, that, there's where the gun with the microwave... Yes. Uh, it's the whole thing where two has the sensibility to be like, yeah, no, we can kind of go for the same vibe with new people. And three is like, let's just Get do Beverly Hills Cop one again. Right. Oh, my God. Like, you know, can we please do that? It, uh, the thing yeah. in that scene is you're just like, well, I'm used to what this is going to be. Uh, he's going to walk in. This snooty art uh, right, right, gallery right. guy is going to dismiss him and write him off and give him the business. What does he offer? Lemon with the cappuccino? I think so. That sounds so yeah, gross. <laughs> Is that a thing? Yes. <laughs> yes. But but the get the fuck out. I will not. It's just <laughs> the moment of like <laughs> Axel's funny. calling like bullshit on this entire industry and Serge kind of agrees with him. Uh yeah. You know where he's like I'm glad someone else recognizes this is ridiculous even though he's part of the ridiculous world. <laughs> um but no that seems very funny. I didn't grow up with perfect strangers. Like, I only know Bronson Pinchot from this. Uh, if that he, makes sense. He had an ABC sitcom called Migo, where he was an alien who was friends with Jonathan Lipnicki. Yeah, haven't seen that one either. Might surprise you to hear that I loved Migo. It sounds like this thing aired six episodes. <laughs> I was tuned in for all six. <laughs> yeah, he had a great part in uh, True Romance. Uh, yeah, that's Scott's right. Movie, he is a true romance. He's great in True right. Romance. Yeah. He's really good in fucking uh, uh, Risky hours, Business. He's in Risky Business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was a good energy guy. Like, yes. you know, you know, give give you give you cool, like crazy energy for a I mean, scene or two. Judge Reinhold, speaking of, a guy who basically for like five or six years was at the absolute center of pop culture. I mean, I love that man. I do too. He's just so lovable. Yes. There's few actors, especially in his 80s parts, that you're just you're just immediately on board with Judge Reinhold always. He's such a sweetie pie. Even though we didn't make um, Beverly Hills Cop 4, but we were attached to it and, and working on the script, if there's our one big contribution to to a change in that script was putting Judge Reinhold back. In he wasn't in was, it? He, he no, no, they used him. to be Taggart. They used to be Taggart and, and just another police officer. And we thought, yeah, no, you, you got to have both. Yeah. You got to have both. So so we were very happy and proud that at least in, in this movie, we got, we got the two cops together. Uh, well done, guys. Thank you. <laughs> But you, you have, like, Oli try to get Maitland. Yeah. And basically be told, like, you can't stop this guy. Like, this guy's basically City Hall. He's unflappable. He's covered his tracks too well. Yeah, you've got the looming thing of this, the chief, Stephen Elliott, mm -hmm. where, like, it's, like, clear that he's the sort of the bulwark. He's the, like, no, 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 you stop this, whatever you're doing. And like, for multiple scenes, you've just had him in the deep background in his office with the door closed. You finally only towards the end have the scene where he walks out and is like, what the fuck is going on in this movie? Like basically just stops the whole film and goes like, how have we been letting this guy run the story? I mean, for sure. Um, okay, what happens? Which goes next? into the final shootout. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then it's right. Then it's Jenny getting kidnapped, basically. Right. Yes. And it's time for the shootout. It's a fast movie. It's not like a long movie at all. It doesn't feel like it outstays its welcome at any point. 
It flows. Um, yeah, it's really flowmatic. It yeah. just flows. It does flow. Flowmatic is a <laughs> yeah, good yeah. It doesn't have like some bullshit kind of refusal of the call nope. moment where Murphy, like, which you could see that getting sort of crowbarred in of like, Axel goes back to Detroit. He gives up. Like, he's not going to figure it out. I don't know. Something like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, we, we hate those moments. They're so like, annoying because you know, they're and, like, and we know the it's reluctant, not going to The reluctant yeah. hero. It's yeah. one of these weird, like, myths where, like, I feel like studio execs feel like you need it in a movie. And it's like, no audience wants these scenes. They're the scenes that slow down the parts you want to get yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the typical, the, like, convincing or, or convincing the other guys to help. Well, yeah. Uh, like, like, no, I'm not going to do it. Come no. on. <laughs> yeah. And it usually takes 30 seconds. Like, yeah. okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just do it then. Or scenes where there is a pause and then you need to do a lot of information to explain the story. Yeah. A lot of exposition. Yeah. If somehow the exposition, yeah, f- flows pretty good in it because it's always in a conflict scene. So you, you don't realize because, you you know, you got, you got Ronnie Cox and, and the other uh, officers asking, you know, Axel fully why they should follow him and and he tries to convince them by giving information about that so th- that's a very smart way to to hide the exposition uh, moment but also his character is on like a straight line the entire movie he is unwavering right he is just like i got to get to the bottom of this i got to find out who fucking killed my friend and make someone pay for this uh, there has to be accountability you never have the scene where he unpacks it where he explains it it is part of what is like makes Eddie so deniable in this film that elevates him to like a different tier of movie star. Is this movie the exposition scenes are purely the exposition of the case of the yeah. crimes, yeah. which are also not over explained. You basically just get the raw details and you never have this guy like open up emotionally, but you understand exactly what he's thinking in every scene. You understand what's driving him. You know, you go from his his chief saying, like, don't go to Beverly Hills. Don't fucking do the case. Yeah. This is your too personal. I mean, it's a it's a it's yeah. a worthy note from the chief, to be clear. He's right. Like, do not investigate your friend's murder. Right. And then he just does it. He's yes. doing it. There's no scene where he looks in a mirror and he goes, like, Am is I this crazy? Should right. I stop? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. He's gotta get these guys. The shootout's very good too. It's very clean and simple. Yeah. Like I feel like breast at that point doesn't have like a ton of experience with like a big set piece. No. And he seems just like completely on top of it. Yeah. Right. Like you totally know what's going on. It is exciting, but it's never like messy or over the top. I don't know. And you're getting to like the formation of the Bruckheimer uh, Simpson house style of like, let's blow up the world's nicest mansion. Let's yes. take the world's most expensive <laughs> objects and put bullets through them. Yeah. So like when you guys are working with Jerry, like I assume he's there always or is he there a lot of the time? Like what what is the level of Jerry that's around when you're making a Jerry Bruckheimer picture? It depends. It depends on the shoot because in our case, during the shoot, he was also doing another movie, right. which is sometimes a, a bigger movie than ours. Right. Like, during Bad Boys for Life, he was doing Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. So he that's was the big a one. lot of time over there. Mm-hmm. That's the biggie. Yeah. And uh, I think that during uh, this one, uh, Bad Boys uh, Ride or Die, he was doing, he's still doing actually, F1. Uh, yeah. Oh, F1 yeah, the crazy uh, yeah. Kaczynski movie, yeah. right? The, yeah, 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 with, with uh, Brad Pitt, which is sort of the, Top Gun on on tracks, <laughs> so, yeah. but in the editing, he's the whole time there. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I always Jerry is always there, even if he's not there. You he's feel always it. yeah, yeah. You <laughs> always feel his presence. Jerry's on it. Uh, um, and we they they were also they were also editing. You know, the new Beverly Hills Cup across the street from where we were doing yeah. Bad Boys. So we were always trying to get information. How is it? Yeah, but <laughs> and Jerry said, "Nope." You don't know shit. <laughs> <You're separate>. So <laughs> we, we had the same editors and we had the same composer. Lauren, right. And we were the whole time asking questions. So how is the the other one? And, and then it would come up with us with like results of test screening and say, oh, it's scored a 95, which is like the highest score yeah. you could ever have. And it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> so, so it was like really this kind of competition. We had to raise the bar to at least match the quality of, of, of that movie. So, so it's going to be amazing. But yeah, Jerry, you know, it's strange because obviously he loves action. He wants the movie to be big. But every time we would pitch like something cool and some explosions or whatever, he would say, yeah, yeah, yes, but it's all about the characters. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why it always, you know, uh, comes back to. 
It is the key, though. Like, when we all, uh, you know, wax poetic about, like, the the 90s touchstone Bruckheimer yeah, Bay run. the big, crazy, explosive movies. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. The joy of those movies that you feel, like, are missing from a lot of our blockbusters today are just, like, packed to the gills with character actors all doing interesting shit. Right, right, right. Yeah. Big, like, uh, broad, but, like, really fun and, like you say, like, good actors, like, having fun doing something that's like not just a stock stereotype. And most of them, the Cage movies in particular, it, part of the calculation is who's the last guy you would expect to be placed at the center of this story? And then they do Armageddon, which is a whole movie of like, the every guy in this is going to be one of those guys. Yeah, Like it's a spaceship filled with people like that. Like that's what I love about Armageddon. I apologize if this is a sensitive question, but I have to ask you guys. Wow. Bad Boys for Life comes out. It is a humongous hit. It breaks January records. Yeah automatically it's clear fourth bad boys has to happen. How quickly is everyone kicking themselves for not being able to call the fourth one bad boys numeral four life? <laughs> At, <laughs> during, like, uh, already during production or during the editing, like, we, 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 show, we start to show the movie yeah. to test audience, test audience reacts really good, and they're like, oh, okay, uh, what do we do? <laughs> do we keep it? Do we change it? Um, and then when, when, you know, there were, there, you know, there, there's like a kind of post credit kind of yeah, scene, yeah. uh, and that post credit scene, we were not sure to, it's basically the movie was already cut. Everything was done. Yeah. And it was a discussion. Like, do we put it in? Because if we put it in, it means that we really believe there's going to be a fourth movie. Yeah. And it, it was really a last minute decision. Right. Yeah. Right, like, before we locked it. It was also a discussion. Like half of the producers were for, the other half were against it. So he's like, you know what? Just, you know, just put it in and we'll see what happens. And then the movie becomes a huge success. And then we really know. Now we have to do this. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, okay. So we kind of hope now that um, uh, that we can do like a Star Wars, you know, Star Wars changed its title to yeah, New yeah, Hope. Just go so back who knows? Maybe we can. Right. Yeah, just swap. <laughs> we can the switch. We can whatever. switcheroo. Yeah, we do a switcheroo. You know, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I know what you guys mean. Where it's like, you guys made a movie. You don't yeah. know that you're going to get to make another one of these, it or it's going to work. Years right. after Bad yeah. Boys Two, you could see how you're like, is the idea that we're getting everyone back together for one last movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why it's full life. It's the it's the last one. Yeah. It's cool. It's this is it, you this know. This is it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can kill off Joey. Well, Pan. we could have why gone we with uh, Bad Boys for Forever, movie? but that that doesn't sound so cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But Bad Boys Forever will be for the fifth movie, so we make it super comfortable. <laughs> right. Just keep, <laughs> keep doing fours. That's right. Yeah, just keep doing that. <laughs> Completely messy with everybody. <laughs> Throwing apart one for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On Beverly Hills Cop, we're mm -hmm. we're basically you know we 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 did it. We talked about Beverly Hills Cop, where yeah. we should, we're obviously we need to play the box office game. It's so crazy that Eddie didn't win an, a Golden Globe for this movie. He was nominated. Yeah. He was obviously this film was nominated for one Oscar for screenplay. screenplay. He was Wait, he which was is snubbed this there. Weird example of your like, it, it's the difference between. <laughs> What is the job of a screenwriter and what do they do? Right. And what is yeah. the final quote unquote script of the movie in the form that you watch it as an audience member where you're like, well, yes, the text of this movie is incredible. It's so clean. It's so sharp. It's zero fat. It's perfectly plotted. And every scene is funny and filled with character. But then you read about it and you're like, that was constructed by basically everyone who touched this movie at any single point in time. It's not like there was like a hard copy of the script that they were reading on the day that would have gotten an Oscar nomination, but the end result no, of the yeah. movie was so undeniable. That's that's why they say you write the script in pre in pre production, production, and post production. In the editing, you rewrite, and that's right. basically what what, what right. What that's the real like script, this. right? Is what you finish up with, yeah. But he lost best actor in a comedy, you know, at the Golden Globes mm -hmm. to Dudley Moore for Mickey and Maud. That is... It's a crazy loss. Absurd. Especially it, when you yes. consider the other nominees were Bill, Bill Murray, Murray for Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters uh -huh. Stephen Martin for All of Me, which is a great performance. Yeah. Robin Williams for Moscow on the Hudson, which, okay. you know, is funny. But, but yeah. like... Uh, Big comic, like, legend performances losing to this forgotten movie. Two of the most movie. iconic leading man comedy performances in history and maybe Steve Martin's best, like, technical work. Right, right. But also the cultural significance yes. that Eddie had in that movie was... Uh, yeah, this it was big. He should have. He should have won. Yes, <laughs> and also get nominated for an Oscar. I would say he yeah. should have been nominated <laughs> for an Oscar. Nominated it's like Oscar. the Amadeus year. You yeah. got both those guys. Yeah. 
You've got um, it's it's a pretty like good Oscar year. F. Murray Abraham, right? Uh, Jeff Bridges and Starman, yeah, is nominated that year, and Sam Watterson in The Killing Fields, and Albert Finney on Under the Volcano. But yeah, Eddie Murphy should be in there. It obviously. was interesting. I I was looking at Letterbox uh, uh, reviews for this movie from people who seem to be maybe twenty or younger, and are like have a very confusing frame of cultural context for Eddie Murphy, right? Where I feel like when we were growing up and we were coming of age when he was hitting his like family star peak, mm -hmm. when the second wave of Eddie was starting with yeah, like Nutty Professor, Nutty Professor and, and everything, right. you understood the context of like, this guy used to be the edgiest, coolest comedy star in the world. And now he's maybe making like broader movies for children. Right. And he's still mm -hmm. making those movies have more edge than you'd expect. And then he goes through like the multiple rotations of like, well, now he's primarily donkey. <laughs> Right. And Dream Girls and Norbit, mm -hmm. and then he sort of pulls back for a while, and now yeah. he's come back and all this sort of stuff. But like the thing that is important to relay, and Beverly Hills Cop is the one that just like locks this in, is like he was kind of cooler than any comedy star had ever been. Right. And outside of just being like a big, funny movie star, he was also just like at the same level of celebrity as like Madonna and Michael Jackson. Like anything he did was yeah. iconic. Yeah. yeah, he was everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, Will, Will and Martin, they look up at Eddie Murphy at, like he's he's the main guy, he's the goat, you yeah. know, and and he's he's he's, he's the, the Godfather. He's, he's the Godfather of them, and it's really great to you know. One time on, on the set of Bad Boys Three, we had this moment. You know, we Will calls it the the Black Mount Rushmore picture where he was. Him and Martin and and Eddie Murphy and and Wesley Snipes was there too wow. and you you just saw the amount of respect that Will and Martin had for him and it was yeah. just you know very touching to see. Yeah, right. uh, you have to. Yeah, I mean, like at that time, hip hop culture was born, you know, yeah. and 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 he was a personification for a whole movement that was happening. Uh, and was also now fully mainstream. Like it's not. Yeah, yeah, worldwide. Yeah, so that, worldwide. That's, and he was representing that, so that's he was he was the one who opened the door for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that he paved the way for for so many of the stars that would come after him. So yeah, that was it's still an iconic an iconic guy, an iconic movie. There's the joke early in the movie that's almost a throwaway. That's a meta joke that feels like it should destroy the reality. But when you're going through the opening montage of him in Beverly Hills, looking aghast at everything, uh, just the insane like exorbitance of the city. And he walks by two guys who are wearing head-to-toe red leather jumpsuits. Mm -hmm. And they're basically <laughs> wearing the jumpsuit that he wears in Delirious. Yes, they're wearing Eddie Murphy jumpsuits. Yes. While he's wearing <laughs> his, like, Letterman jacket right. and his, like, jeans and sweatshirt or whatever. He's dressed like a man of the people. Right. And he, like, does the classic Eddie Murphy laugh at how ridiculously these guys are dressed. Right. And... But yet he was the guy who a year earlier was able to wear an outfit that ridiculous with such confidence that everyone was like, I guess that's cool. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When every other stand-up at that point in time has basically been a dude in a, like a sweaty suit, like loosening his necktie. I mean, the, the, obviously the Letterman jacket is like one of the most iconic pieces of costume design. Like so, yeah. so simple, so effective. Like everyone wanted one after that. Like, yeah. And this movie just has a perfect button of him like... Uh, uh, gifting Rosewood and Taggart with the bathrobes. Yeah. And then sort of revealing <laughs> the charges that the <laughs> Beverly yeah. Hills Police Department are going to have to pick up. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's crazy to see. You, you see that movie, you, 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 you compare that to the first Bad Boys. It's it's really like almost like a remake yeah. of of, uh, of Beverly Hills Cop, and 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 you could you could put put all those movies, all those Jerry Bruckheimer movies, back together, and you see like there's like some kind of pattern that yeah. that made all those movies, you know, very very successful, and 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 the audience loves watching. You know, it's like a comfort food kind of movie. Hundred percent. Like Bad Boys, though, you're right. Is the is him being like, let's do kind of a '90s Beverly Hills Cop. Like that's the most profound update I feel like he'd made to the formula. Right, since doing Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, and similarly, like, Bad Boys as a franchise becomes about their dynamic, but the first movie is, like, a relatively small premise, yeah. which is just the mistaken identity of the two guys. Right. And then once you solidify those characters, you're like, well, now it's just these guys can these go off. The guys. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. it's their sensibility, yeah. it's their world. What's the 2000s one? Hmm. I don't know. I'll think about it. Rush Hour 98 is another yeah, one. Yeah, it's a big one. Right. But that's not Bruckheimer. But, and look, I love the first Rush Hour. Yeah. But like, 
they, they both exist as comedy characters first and foremost for most of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's two fishes out of water, though, I guess, is sort of the... But even the tenor, like, you never... It, it, the case... Eddie just fucking is a real person in this. Well, let's play the box office game. Okay. December 7th, 1984. Griffin. It we ends up actually, being the highest grossing film this year? Uh, That's obviously a late release, but I do think it ends of up... Of the 1984 movies. Of the 84 it has releases? Be, right? Yeah. No, Ghostbusters. Is. Ghostbusters. Okay. Right. But those are these are the two biggest movies. of Which famously, of course, that's the other thing was that uh, Winston was written for Eddie Murphy and he drops out of it to do Beverly Hills Cup. What in any other situation would have been a bad decision. But obviously worked yeah. out great for him. We've actually done this once before, but okay. we're going to do it again. Uh, number one is Beverly Hills Cop, $15 million. It ends up at? 234. Wild. Adjusted for inflation is still the number one R-rated. Movie. Yeah, just for inflation, yeah. it made like seven hundred million dollars. Okay, yeah. that's uh, above uh, Passion of the Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Above most yeah. James Cameron movies. Um, yeah, 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 crazy. Number two, Griffin is the the movie that we covered the last time we hmm. did this. A Patreon uh, episode of ours. It was a Patreon episode, December eighty four. Was yeah. it uh, twenty ten? Yes. The year we made contact? That's right. I just you know two thousand ten, the very strange sequel to two thousand and one. Many <laughs> years later. Is it Peter Hyams? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys ever seen 2010? Well, yeah, it's, it's, well, you know, it's, it's not as bad it's as everybody movie. says. It's all right. It's yeah. a but it's, movie. uh, you ex they explain a lot where yes. the other one yeah, is. Yeah, a they're mystery, like, right, let's know? explain like, everything that happened now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we did a Patreon episode on a while ago. I first guessed for Kubrick. Is that where we did that? Yeah. Yeah. It was a fun episode. Oh, where do you think we did for Elaine May? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, number three, also new this week, is okay. a flop. Mm. Another sort of buddy crime comedy hmm, but a that is not working. It's very star driven, but it's kind of this sign of like mm, the seventies are over and the eighties are it here. City Heat, City Heat, the uh, Clint Eastwood, Eastwood and Reynolds. Burt Reynolds, Burt and Clint. It's like a throw. It's like a thirties gangstery kind of movie. Yeah, it's like a prohibition buddy cop movie. Yeah, Richard Benjamin. Never heard of that one. <laughs> <though>. It's <laughs> forgotten. Right. It's like, and obviously, like Eastwood is a star throughout the eighties. Yeah. Reynolds is obviously kind of. On the downswing. But they were also best but it's friends a, it's, and yeah, came it's up them. together and it was like they're finally doing a movie together and no one gave a shit. No one cared and like, you know, it's like Beverly Hills Cop is the story. Yeah. As is the number four, which has been hanging around for two months. It's sci-fi action movie we've covered on this podcast. A great movie. I'm sure these guys like it too. Is it a Carpenter? Nope. No, fuck. Uh, Terminator? Bam. The first Terminator. Ah, the Terminator. Yeah. Yay. Yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, which is... What a year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know what? I was wrong about uh, uh, Stallone's uh, interest being in competition with Schwarzenegger for this movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very wrong. Number that five... Kicks in later. Okay. ...is an action film starring in it's sort of like the big star making thing for an action star but he's like a you know kind of a, a lower tier hmm. action star but it but it he he, i feel become, like this is his best known movie this is his best known movie there's like a zillion you know straight to video sequels is it missing an action chuck norris chuck missing oh. an action yeah but that's 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 also a classic it's, I it's yeah. a classic it's it's, it's yeah, definitely it's, a classic but right, like if right, that's Chuck Norris's most yeah. famous movie, right? What's the other one? Delta Force. Delta Force. Yeah, but I was like, like the Octagon. Action, well, of course, yes. You know, mostly Walker Texas Ranger, you know. <laughs> and I mean, then that's, right, that's, right later. But right. like, I feel like if it's like, if he has a franchise, it's missing in action. Yeah. Probably. I've always considered Walker Texas Ranger to be more of an eight hundred hour movie. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Did he? And I watched them all. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've also got you got Night of the Comet, really, you know, I love that cool movie. weird the movie. Fred Decker movie. Yep. Yeah. Um, you've got Supergirl. Uh, speaking of Batgirl, right. you've yeah, got the Helen Slater Supergirl movie. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too when I was a kid. Uh, Supergirl, terrible mm -hmm. movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, so it, yeah. I, at the time, I didn't know. I was too small. I thought it was cool. Yeah. Is it, <laughs> wait, who's the? Is it Faye, Faye Dunaway? Dunaway? Yeah. Faye yeah, Dunaway's yeah. the villain. Yeah. yeah. And there's like a sort of like a, there's like an orb or like a diamond or She's a crystal like or something. Witch. It's yeah. that era still of making comic book movies and being like, and we'll make up some villain, right? right? We, Why would not we take anything from the, from the comics, comics? Right. Let's do something else. Uh, oh God, you devil! Is that the third Oh God yes, movie? We will cover this trilogy someday. You got a movie called Falling in Love. That's I like the looked up De Niro. This. Yeah, De Niro and Meryl Streep. Yeah, kind of a forgotten movie. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Right, was, uh, never, wow. <laughs> whoa. Okay. Whoa. Never heard of that one. Yeah. And then the best picture winner of 1984, Amadeus, mm -hmm. is number 10. Amadeus. Oh, Great movie. Hey, that's, uh, that's, yeah. the, that movie's dope, it's yo. It's perfect. That movie's movie dope. It's so good. There's yeah. nothing, nothing Love it. like bad yeah. I would ever say about Amadeus. No, Great no, best no, picture no. winner. It's really Salieri. <sighs> uh, um, but yeah, that's it. Guys, thank you so much for coming on to do this. This is crazy. Oh, thank you for having it. us. Thank you. It was awesome. Yeah. I hope I hope you guys had a good time. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, we're looking forward to Bad Boys, uh, Ride or Die. Mm -hmm. uh, is yeah. there anything else? Not for, not for life. Not for, for life. life. <laughs> but I mean, maybe in watch. a couple of years it changes. Maybe <laughs> for now it's Ride or Die. Go <laughs> watch Bad Boys for life anytime. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to plug before we uh, ship out? People should check out Rebel, which is yep. watchable, streamable in the states, uh, rentable. Thank Thanks, man. Uh, and and maybe maybe use ExpressVPN, uh, past and future sponsor, to check out some of your other movies that might be lost. Yeah, who knows? Maybe some hits. And also, maybe one day the movie in the fridge is gonna come out. Who oh knows? My <laughs> I my dream. Can I just ask? Because he's like my favorite living movie star. What, what was it like working with Keaton? What was your experience like with him? It's like your little kid. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. It's cooler than what you can imagine. It's, yeah. Yeah. He walks on set and it's just like this aura. He's Batman. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, he's, that's why for us, personally, we grew up. He's our Batman oh, yeah. forever and for life. Yes. Yeah. Well, not yeah. forever. Returns. Yeah, returns. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> all right. Take uh, us out, Griffin. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all much for love. listening. Thank you. Thank you to Marie Barty mm -hmm. for Social helping media. to produce the show. Yep. Thank you to Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork, AJ McKeon, Alex Barron for our editing. AJ McKeon is also our production coordinator. Thank you to JJ Birch for our research, Lee Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. A special thank you to our beloved Ben Hosley for putting in the extra hustle and finding a uh, studio in LA where Adil and Bilal could record together on very short turnaround. So thank you for putting in that extra work, Ben. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon Blank Check special features, where mm -hmm. we are currently doing the Ninja Turtles franchise. Yep. Uh, that sounds right. Yep. And uh, we'll have just done an episode on Martin Brest's two uh, student films, his shortness feature, Hot Dogs for Gauguin, and Hot Tomorrows, yep. which I Check think is out. a fun episode. They're very Important fun. context yep. for this guy whose career uh, had a, a wildly... Uh, kind of shot out from the rocket start. Uh, tune in next week for Midnight Run, one of the best fucking movies ever. Cool movie. Uh, with returning guest Alan Seppenwall. Yep. And as always. <laughs> <laughs>